So we're so happy to welcome you to our, we're calling it the Gratitude 365 Podcast Network and the Abundance Mindset, which is such an important issue for so many people. Um, kind of reminds me, today's newsletter, it's about going from mindfulness to manifestation. And I think so many people relate to this. You know, they're practicing mindfulness, they're meditating, um, they're doing that inner work, going within, they're doing affirmations and intentions. And even though they're doing all that inner work and walking the walk, they're still struggling. And I think that is often a big disconnect in our world is how to do that, but not stress out doing it. You don't want it to be such a, a hard and fast process that it stresses you out just trying to do the process, you know? So I think that um, is kind of the core issue. How do we show people how to attract abundance naturally? And you, Jill Renee Feeler, and you go as a psychic intuitive, is that correct? It's hard to find a term that describes what I do because I offer um, alternative philosophies and alternative operating systems, which are basically belief systems. Um, and I also do readings, what are called readings, and that is psychic intuitive. Um, there's different types of psychic intuition. Um, some are more prophetic, and let me tell you your future. That's not mine, and I don't even believe that that's possible, so I'm skeptical. I think mm -hmm. everyone should be skeptical <laughs> of the type of readings that, that are, and also taking someone out of their own personal authority. Um, I, I have a, yeah, I'm picky about the way that I do my readings to support the individual and in helping them see things that they otherwise are not seeing, helping them get out of their own way um, and offering transcendent insight to help them decide what feels best to them, given the new insights that I'm offering. I love that it's um I'm taking a coaching course right now. Kind of reminds me of the you know the coaching experiences not talking about the past and all the mistakes and everything that you you're trying to overcome but talking about where do I want to go? Where is that feel good place I'm trying to get to and kind of change your mindset. And I like how you kind of put the ball in the client's hands. You know, we create our own future with every decision we make. And I think that, I love how you say that you can't necessarily predict the future because we're still creating it. And I think that's very hopeful for, you know, people that maybe think their life is already determined, kind of depressing exactly. because what am I gonna change if yeah. it's already all decided, you know? Yeah. There, there are a lot of, um, and I, maybe I should back up a little bit. My background is very mainstream. Um, my family is very mainstream in a lot of ways. That was my upbringing. Um, psychic intuition was not a part of my world prior to my recognizing my gifts, which I sort of stumbled across at like 38, 39 years old. So I was more surprised than anyone that number one, it's possible. Number two, that I could do it. Um, but the feeling of supporting another person in a way that they, I mean, it's very unique and it does feel incredibly soulful. Um, the process of, you know, how I'm getting it, the clear cognizant that I'm utilizing, um, the way that it comes up and the way that it lines up alongside my linear kind of very highly rational, highly kind of logical mind. I have an MBA. I did strategic planning and corporate for almost, almost wow. two decades, I think. So that's my, that's my background. So I wasn't steeped in sort of the metaphysical and um, it's all just energy man <laughs> kinds of energy. <laughs> you know what I mean? That wasn't my world. So I offer a very different perspective. I'm also not attached to some of the other beliefs. I call them operating systems that people are utilizing. So I'm willing to criticize my own operating system when I come across I something that. that to me doesn't make sense. It's like, oh, wait, no. So I started to have an aversion to the word attraction because I was like, but wait, we're not magnets. I mean, we are creator energy, but we're operating in a system in this, in this time-space continuum that is highly um, unpredictable. 
I think, ungameable um, and beyond mechanization in terms of trying to mechanize your outcome that you want to have. I don't think it works like that. And I have experienced that it doesn't work that way. So I have a lot of um, observable evidence over the 10 years that I've been doing this work of where people really start to run into problems with limited or false, uh, just maybe dysfunctional is a better word, belief systems that aren't offering what they promise to offer. Mm -hmm. So I'm sometimes too blunt for some people and I'll own that. It's always done with love though. I It is always out of love that I'll offer somebody a different perspective so that they're not taking it personally if something isn't going the way that they wanted it to. Yeah. And that maybe it isn't them. Maybe what they were told of how to do something or how this world works isn't true. Maybe somebody wanted it to be true. Maybe it felt true for somebody, but they can't prove that either. And then other, I just feel like there's millions of people trying to follow these sort of step-by-step -step approaches of if I just do this, and if I just do that, and if I just think positive, then I'll live the life of my dreams. I don't, think nor observe that this world actually works that way. It's much more unfair than that. I think that honesty liberates us to be more honest with ourselves, honest with our goals, that we can do a whole bunch of things right. And sometimes it still doesn't go the way we want it to. Right. That humility that yes, we are creator energy, but we don't get to control other people. We only get to control ourselves. And we certainly don't get to control how things go. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, we talked about the other side of abundance. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of Esther Hicks and she talks a lot about the feeling state, but that's a million dollar question. How do you feel abundant? If you're not abundant, uh, you can say, okay, I'm going to feel abundant now. So how do you, you know, that's a real um, shift in your mm -hmm. thinking. And that's, I think, very challenging for people who are trying to achieve that. I'm going to say something possibly very controversial right now. And I don't mean it to be disrespectful of Esther or Jerry, the late Jerry, rest in peace. I don't believe that they became so successful because they were operating from a feeling of abundance. Mm -hmm. I believe that they were successful because they had a beautiful set of ideas for how to help the world. And they have helped millions of people be a better version of themselves. And that is fantastic, right? They were also very savvy in sales and marketing and distribution and presentation and to me, that doesn't take it all away from the transcendence that, that Esther is and that Jerry is and that their process is. But do you see what I'm saying? They, mm -hmm. I, I think it's more than that. I think that's uh, why you are so uniquely equipped, you know, full spectrum to be of service, right? I hope so. I hope so, Charles. <laughs> well, I mean, it's sort of like, you know, I've been in a lot of rooms, a lot of people, you're discerning, you're wise, you're balanced. You've got, I mean, you have it all, planning to intuition. I mean, I, I can't wait to learn more. I'm so <laughs> glad you. I tuned in today, ladies and gentlemen. So glad I'm here with both of you. <laughs> yeah, I really like how you say we shouldn't be afraid to criticize ourselves or laugh at ourselves. Oh my gosh, I was doing that last year and that just really didn't work, but mm -hmm. that's okay. Uh, Charles has coined his very famous phrase. He's progressively failing his way to success. <laughs> and I think that just takes such a great sense of humor, which of course he has that, you know what, I'm gonna laugh at myself, but it's gonna be in a loving way. Like, hey, look at all these great things you've tried. Good for you for putting yourself out there. But let's try something different. That didn't really work. And to be okay with that. Yeah. The other very real part of this, if we just look at the, the factual outcomes, right? There are individuals that are in extreme poverty in the world that have happiness. Mm -hmm. There are individuals that have extreme wealth that have happiness. There are also individuals that have extreme poverty that are very unhappy. There are also very extreme wealthy individuals that are very unhappy. 
So that's the, a good point. The brain can trick us into thinking I'm not happy because, and it's, and the brain easily latches onto this idea of, oh, well, if I just fix those variables in my life, then I'll be happy. And that isn't true. I, I'm blessed in financially with my husband and I, we have our own version of, of story of how we've been able to um, achieve what we have and acquire what we have, but we are very much the same people we were before. We were very happy in that, that sweet little first house that we had um, mm-hmm. with the used cars that we had, you know what I mean? Um, we, and we enjoy this too, but we also were not feeling like we were all that because, you know, we had this or had that. And now that we have what we have, we are also not thinking we are all that because of, we are not what we have. Right. But I think to people that feel like what they're missing is what they don't have. That is a trap of self-deception and mm-hmm. I think lack of awareness, lack of personal honesty, and it really deprives them of experiencing and allowing for the transcendental joy and sense of divine beingness that we all have access to even with nothing, right? So many individuals as children, they were oblivious to the possessions that they had, right? Mm -hmm. They weren't aware of their parents' income for the most part. I mean, as children, we were very uh, blissfully naive, right? Right. So, But yet there's so many people that are kind of striving and seeking and all these things. And yet if you ask them, but can you, do you have happy memories as a child? Oh yeah, I do. I mean, not all of it, maybe, but there were pockets that I, I mean, that was a great experience. That was a great experience. Okay. That happiness that you felt in that moment, was it ever based on what you had or what you achieved or what you, what your, you know, physical environment looked like, or was it, it a wasn't. state? Yeah. It, wasn't. it never is. Right. Yeah. That's a great point. My happy memories don't have anything to do with money. Or possession, or stuff, probably so being with the different people and the different memories that I can still close my eyes and be there, you know, today in my mind. Yes. So that to me would be a much more effective, um, and I'm outcome based, right? If something works, I'm all for it. If something doesn't work, I'm curious about why. <laughs> you know what I mean? Before yeah. I throw, before I throw the idea out, I'm kind of curious and want to tinker with it. But that kind of uh, state of being and meditation and mantra even of, okay, let me, let me feel my happiest feeling I can think of in this lifetime, mm-hmm. right? Seeing my child for the first time, both of my kids, that was epic. But just, yeah. you know, playing with friends or, you know, you know, my sisters or something in childhood, just, you know, running around the yard, playing kick the can. I mean, yeah. I can pick bad idea, bad memories for sure. They're there. But I can also, if I allow myself that feeling of bliss and joy and enjoying me and enjoying life and enjoying others, that is, that is recoverable. Um, and it is, it is, we are able to access that because those memories don't go away. They're kind of in our field, in our, in our auric field, really, um, mm-hmm. in the ball of energy that we are, all of that stuff is there. And I, it's sad that so many people selectively pick the negatives versus mm-hmm. the positives. And that's just, it's unfortunate, but it's a, it's a mental pattern. This is a hard world. I mean, we have a negativity bias as humans, um, that's been studied in, in psychology that we're more in, you know, we tend to remember the negative stuff much more readily than the positive. Mm. And you do have to make an effort to go, I do have a lot of happy memories and I can tune into those and maybe get into that state and feed off of that instead of trying to say, I'm going to feel abundant for the next 10 minutes. And right. that's not going to work because I don't really know. I'm still thinking about my to-do list and the bills and, you know, so it's just not going to work. <sighs> but uh, yeah, I really love that idea that, you know, just trying to teach people what is your happiest state and kind of building on that exactly. is kind of one route to this. Exactly. So even in my work, I don't, I don't want to know in the first, especially with private sessions or my coaching work, I don't want to know their goals. What we start out with is what I, with my intuitive gifts are, it's I'm using my claircognizant gifts to assess 
what are their strengths in this lifetime? What Mm -hmm. are their most, I use the word godly, but people can use whatever term they want to, but what is the most source like that's currently operating within them? Because that's a strength set that they're probably, they didn't learn here, tends to be natural tendencies. Some people are really generous. Some people are really hardworking. Um, Some people are very um, forgiving of others. Some people are very discerning, even skeptical, right? All of these are positive attributes and it's a natural part of our framework. So by starting there, you have a better basis for everything they are, everything they create and everything they choose going forward. But it's so Hmm. bizarre to me how that godly structure that all humans have feels so uh, blind. It's like a blind spot from the brain And I mean, let's be honest, all five human senses point outward. And then the brain is interpreting everything from an outer sense. So those inner sensory awareness systems tend to be uh, discounted by the brain because the brain loves what it helped acquire. Oh, yeah, we took that class. I worked hard on that. I studied that, right? So the brain as this engineer, (laughs) right, is constantly like devaluing the natural state of grace and godliness that all humans have. But I think that's the best starting point for anything good in one's life. Yeah. I mean, I love that. Um, I know you had some questions. I don't know if you want to get into some of those. The first one was about the truth about lack in financial abundance. What are your thoughts on that? So Regarding financial abundance, I mean, I know some, I mean, we're friendly with, we're neighbors with some ex- very, I mean, wealth is relative, right? But these are, have their own private jet kind of people, okay? There are regularly conversations about, we don't, we don't have the money for that. We don't have the money for that. And you wouldn't think that anyone with that amount of wow. wealth would <laughs> have a sense of, yeah, somebody else has more than me. They're there is a That's very, it is interesting. And then there's some individuals and I know, I know members of my audience that have done incredible some of my trips with me and they don't know how they're going to pay for it. And their sense is, well, I just put it on a credit card and then, you know, the universe <laughs> will provide the money back to me. And I'm just looking at them like, wow, I would, I would never do that. I'm so happy you're there. So happy they're in Egypt with me, right? Because we have an amazing experience together. But there is a part of my Jill that gets concerned about, oh my God, how's that going to go? You know, and yeah. sometimes it does work out. And sometimes they, you know, work more hours at a day job uh, to pay off that credit card debt. But it's just, there's a lot of interesting theories about how money works. And lack is, in some ways, a mindset lack is also, I think, a feature of this reality. And Mm -hmm. one of the reasons is you will always find somebody that has more than you have, right? More of anything, more of anything positive, more of anything negative, right? So when you can recognize that where you have lack or where you have voids in your life, doesn't have to be a source of misery, doesn't have to be a source of problem or challenge, It can be a feature set that all humans have, right? So abundance doesn't fix that. And I mean, the more I, you know, the more success that my husband and I have acquired the and created, I should say, because I don't feel like we, my words are not that we attracted it. I mean, we can look at all the steps and all the hard work we put into what we, what we have and all the luck involved in all of it. And I do believe in luck for sure. Good luck and bad luck. Um, there is, there are so many ways that we can not take misfortune or something not going as planned or as desired. Don't take it so personally, mm-hmm. right? There are just, this reality is, is I think ungameable and it is very humbling <laughs> to, for, for any, any, uh, version of human, even very, very savvy, very well-designed humans, Um, because I do believe we design our incarnation, even very well-designed lives and structures of humanity um, are kind of like, oh, that hurt. Like that was, that was, that felt like bad luck right there. I don't think I caused that. Oh, that, okay. You know what I mean? But over-personalizing what does and doesn't happen in our lives is another problematic feature. And that lack is it's this fear. There's fear associated with lack, but we all have something less than something else someone else has. 
So yeah. we all have some version of lack. So does is it as big of a problem as sometimes our brain is interpreting it as? Yeah, and I think with anything, we take so many things for granted, even our good health. Um, just mm -hmm. an example, I was in, I work at the University of Cincinnati as a psychology professor, and they have a mind-body seminar once a week where about eight or 10 of us, you know, talk about our lives and mindfulness and everybody went around the room. And I was so humbled because I really hadn't realized how lucky I am to be in healthy mind body mm. um, because there was a woman that had complex PTSD. There was another woman who was in tears. She had had a stroke and she's learning how to walk again. And <clears throat> another beautiful woman, she said she's in pain pretty much all the time from like a car accident injury. And mm. they were just, you know, everybody had such a, a story. I almost felt like I shouldn't even be here, you know, telling my story and whatever I'm struggling with, but it made me realize it's all relative. Um, if you have good health and you can walk and you've got some money in the bank and a home, you're pretty darn lucky. And I think just mm -hmm. kind of comparing it to someone that is struggling with chronic pain or, you know, whatever they're struggling with is uh, very humbling. I think. That's, and that's fair. I can totally see why that. Yeah, exactly. This um, and the compassion. Oh my gosh, the compassion. There's endless compassion, endless grace, and of course, unconditional love available to all of us, um, including us for ourselves, right? Um, uh, from a transcendence teachings level, which is normally my angle, what I love to um, offer people, whether it's in my podcasts or, or anything that I'm doing, we are more than that experience. So when somebody mm -hmm. is pain, when somebody is grieving, right? But you are also more than your grief. There's a yeah. there's layers of you. There's a range of you that is very preoccupied and feels overwhelmed with the grief and or with the pain or with the struggle. And that's very real. And there's no need, or it's also not serving self to to disregard that. But what about the range of you that that is also operating well? beyond right. the grief, beyond the pain. Um, there are some individuals that in the midst of tremendous grief, they want to go to work, right? And people, their coworkers yeah. will say, what are you doing here? Like your parent just died or, you know, you lost your, your pet or your child just died. What are you doing here? And I love these stories and I'm getting goosebumps of these individuals that say, I know what to do here. I don't know what to do with that yet. So I'm not, I'm not denying it's, it's happening. I'm not, this is an escape for me. Mm -hmm. I don't want to live in only that grief or only that pain, right? Yeah. Um, individuals that have, you know, terminal cancer that still want to go to work because they feel joy in it. They feel successful yeah. in it. They feel service in it. And that sense of, I don't know how long I'll be able to do this, but while I can, would you guys please let me, <laughs> you know, just yeah. do my job and let me feel useful. And I get joy out of that in the world. And some people are like that. So that's a good example, a very real example of transcendence. Could you mm -hmm. speak of that at a larger level in life, like career or relationships? Yes. So transcendence is the range of ourselves. And I, I, I really encourage range and I'm using, I'm using my hands to go wider. I don't do higher because then the brain readily interprets that as, oh, I'm lower. And no, mm -hmm. I mean, that's normally not an ideal state. So narrower versus wider tends to be a better operating system I found. So all of us have a range of ourselves that is beyond our five human senses beyond our human experiences, beyond our soul's experiences that is available to us to, for us to utilize and operate as and allow for no matter what's going on in our life. Okay. So the brain has a hard time with this because the brain wants to understand it. How, why, how does it work? What do I do? Right. Those are all brain oriented questions and they are great questions. But what I found with transcendence is it is so much about, it's almost like sitting back in a chair. You're allowing for a seat almost of somehow inner wisdom or inner curiosity or some sort of off-ramp from nonsense and on-ramp onto something much bigger and much better. 
Um, one very real example I like to offer people, most people have had at least one experience where they were communicating with another person and the most amazing words came to them. The most mm -hmm. amazing thing to say or thing to write. And it's almost like the, you operate in a very kind of like uh, out, not out of body, but beyond your body kind of experience. There's a, there's a otherworldly kind of surrealness to it. The brain is sort of curious, like, oh my God, this is amazing. What am I about to say next? Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it is beyond the brain and it tends to be amazing. And I like the term godly transcendent. So that is transcendence. Your brain wasn't like, Hmm, what do I say in this situation? It wasn't also trying. It wasn't the brain wasn't like, we need something transcendent here. The brain right. sort of let another range of you run and you didn't get in its way. Your brain didn't get in its way. The rest of you didn't get in its way. And you allowed another range of you to function. So once I learned how to do that with that first reading, or re maybe, I mean, kind of learned how to do it, but realized it was even possible. I was like, oh my God, I feel more alive. I feel mm -hmm. more, pre not present, because that doesn't do it justice. I feel like way, like a way better Jill than I ever could have, <laughs> ever could have dreamed yeah. it was even possible when I was doing that reading. And I drove home that night just going, I want to feel this way, like all the time. Is that even possible? Yeah. Um, so obviously, I'm still very a, a very flawed human in, in different ways of my Jill. And I allow this transcendence. And I realize they can be right next to each other. That's one of mm -hmm. the biggest misconceptions to me of enlightenment and transcendence and ascension type teachings is that it's after you work through all your flaws after you learn all of these lessons, after, 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 it makes it very linear. Sounds like a brain to me, right? Yeah. Um, so transcendence is available no matter what kind of a messed up person somebody is or how kind of um, maybe they're a total jerk, right? And in certain moments, they allow for this transcendence, this, oh my gosh, I'm a better version of myself right now. And you can allow for that more and more in your life. Well, it sounded like you just came up with a long version of a possible title of the pocket size, pocket size cliff notes version for how do you introduce transcendence to someone who's never been exposed to the to the concept? Yeah. Yeah. I like I, how you put it's it's right there. You don't have to wait right until there. you've you can meditate eight hours a day or, you know, you've achieved a certain level of success. I mean, right. it's right there. You can just access it um, by allowing it to just kind of flow in and, you know, get your brain out of the way. Always. It's Always. Right I mean, it's, it's right yeah, it, yeah. So it's, it's here, but I'm not, I'm trying not to interpret that it's outside of you. It's definitely not above you and it's not out in front of you. Yeah. It's a, I believe that we all operate in sort of a spherical uh, orbital form of energy. And mm -hmm. we can operate in a really, when we're angry or when we're frustrated or when we're fearful or afraid or, or in pain, our bubble feels very small. We feel like yeah. that's all that we are. So our range of self is really tiny and it's not much beyond that. So in our transcendent operating range, it's huge. You feel way bigger than just your human experiences, way bigger than what just, you know, what you know or don't know, um, way bigger than, you know, how, how good of a person, you know, or how enlightened you are, whatever. It's always available. I've had kids um, experience, you know, tell me and operate in a very transcendent way at times. And I just, I, I love it because to me, mm -hmm. that's the, that's the breakthrough that humanity I feel is begging for is that all of yeah. us are allowing for more of that transcendence. It may not be 24 seven. It probably won't be 24 seven because right. there's still red lights. There's still cancer. <laughs> there's still bills to yeah. pay. <laughs> there's still work to do, right? There's still poop in the yard to pick up from your dog. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's all of that, which is never going to feel like, oh, this is great. I got a red light, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Well, that kind of reminds me of the feeling if you're someone that meditates and if you've ever gotten a warm feeling like during a meditation, you just kind of know you're connecting with spirit and you just want to stay there forever. It just feels like a warm bath or a warm hug. 
which mm. I experienced a lot after my mother died and I would mm. try to meditate and just, and I could tell when she was there because it was just like a warm hug and it was just the most beautiful, soft, lovely feeling. And it's like, you have to allow that to come in there. You have to put all your barriers to the side and be okay with that, you know, and be open to that. But kind of reminds me of that process of just allowing oh, that's that to kind of beautiful. come in. Yeah. Beautiful. But, uh, I, I'm a bit of a, a wordy. I love language. I love human language. Um, I love English language. And I do notice that sometimes the words that we use can also be an indicator of an energetic, um, maybe inflexibility or a way mm -hmm. that our, our structure is getting in the way. So I'll just offer another way of looking at connection to source in, in the system that I use that does tend to work really well. Source isn't something you connect to. It's mm -hmm. something you are. Oh, I like that. And it, isn't it easier? Didn't the brain just go? Mm -hmm. That's, that's easier, right? So then yeah. it's always available. So then you can't be disconnected. It's impossible right. to be disconnected from our source energy, but mm -hmm. it's very, we're very capable. All, all, all human life is of operating in a way that feels in ignorance to, or in arrogance of <laughs> maybe, um, it doesn't look godly. There's a lot of human actions, human thoughts, and human behaviors that don't look or act godly. Um, but that wasn't that they weren't source. It's that maybe consciously or unconsciously, probably unconsciously, they were unaware that they were operating out of step, out of rhythm with their soulfulness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, out of alignment, for sure. Out of alignment, not. yeah. So this is where I'm not... I'm not mad at the, at the world religions. I feel like all of them, they must offer value or <laughs> number one, they wouldn't be global, <laughs> right? They're trying to offer humans a system of being a better version of themselves, being approved of by God, um, some afterlife, maybe inclinations there and security. Um, and they're, they're wrapped in a way though, in my opinion, that dishonors the sovereignty, the personal authority, the godliness that all humans have access to. Yeah. And I'll never get to run this experiment, but I'm very curious about every individual that literally does commit acts of crime. If they were more aware of their transcendence, if they would have felt more choices in that moment beyond their psychopathy, beyond their sociopathy, right? In that moment of okay, wait, like there's another range of me. I don't think that the bigger, the bigger part of me, the better part of me wants mm -hmm. to do this, right? Um, overdose, you know, suicide. There are just so many ways yeah. that, that we can get caught up in a, in a sense of um, diminishment of our godliness and almost like denialism of our transcendence. And it breaks my heart. The people that are hurt, the individuals yeah. that are, hurting themselves over and over again and hurting others. I mean, I have clients whose uh, children or partners or loved ones are addicts and it is heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Um, and it's hard to get through to someone if they don't want to help themselves, you know, if they can't see that they can change, but it's going to take some work. You know, it's hard to get out of that cycle. So big. Definitely I love what is. you just said right there, Leslie. And as a, I mean, with your amazing and advanced training in psychology, I mean, you have a PhD in psychology, yeah? Uh, it's a master's degree. Okay. Impressive. Yeah. Um, that's not easy, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, that there's so many storylines about how this will always affect you. And I think that's true. I think that some of those, what leads to a diagnosis, those patterns are always available to that individual. But I am an eternal optimist. I'm always hopeful that somebody can uh, create enough patterns of, of healthfulness and, and wholeness within themselves that they can function at least better than they were before, where they're yeah. harming themselves less. And I mean, you don't want them to harm others either. Yeah, it's almost like someone in the midst of an addiction, you know, my niece overcame addiction and now she's the mother to four beautiful children but she was a heroin addict and mm -hmm. i don't know that i could have talked to her at that time 
and and explained anything that she would have resonated with. I think she just mm-hmm. had to make a choice that that wasn't you know going to be how she was going to live any longer. And you know what a brave person to have overcome that. But you know yes. I wonder how you speak to people. They have to be ready to come to you and say you know there's got to be a better way. You know I don't want to do this anymore. And I I mean my hope is I mean my kind of dreamy vision is that they would never have to come see me, that they would somehow just have access to, I mean, sometimes I think some people just have a breakthrough all the all on their own. You know, yeah. there's just this moment of, I don't want to do this anymore, or right. you know, and enough is enough, because addiction is like a hijacking. Mm-hmm. Addiction to me, any kind of addiction is, it's almost like energetically, there's a hijacker on the plane. Mm-hmm. So what... Uh, individuals that are facing any type of addiction often indicate when I'm talking with them is that in the, they feel like they're operating in the background and something else is operating their mouth. Something else is operating the brain. Something else is moving the hands. So it requires at some level for them to acknowledge, I have to step in. Yeah. I have to step in and take over myself, my Mm -hmm. senses, my my operating of who and what I am. I can't let this other energetic force of addiction and whatever the addiction is needing to feed itself. Right. Yeah. Um, It's just, it's, this is a, we are really complex systems as humans. This is a very complex reality. Um, I, I think we serve ourselves better by being honest with the complexity of all of those things. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really, um, and again, just being open enough to know that you're not going to be perfect. And so many people beat themselves up um, every day because they didn't achieve this or, you know, they're 10 pounds heavier than they want to be. And, you know, it's really about, okay, I can love myself, even though I'm not maybe at the weight I want to be at, or I don't have the partner I want. I can still adore myself um, every moment of every day. It doesn't matter, you know, somebody else isn't going to come in and I'm going to change all of a sudden. It's got to be, you know, you got to be happy within yourself to achieve anything in life. Beyond those feature sets, right? And I am so glad you brought up this topic, Leslie, because this one is another very common real life one. Um, I'm 52, postmenopausal, might be TMI. I'm okay with that. Um, It's hard, right? I did Mm -hmm. not have to think about my weight prior to probably 40 and that was yeah. with, you know, to even just getting back to pre-baby weight with the kids. For me, it was always easy. So yeah. I did, I definitely took it for granted. Um, and now at 52, it's just like, this is hard, <laughs> you know, it is hard. and, yeah. and for, for some individuals, it was, it was always hard. And I have extra, extra compassion uh, for them that, oh my God, I, I don't, you know, but there is, there's the bigger part of me, the transcendent version of my Jill knows that I can look as good as I can, you know, pretty good, you know, for relative to myself competing with myself at 52, right? I have, I have the opportunity to look like my best Jill, no matter what number is on that pant size or that dress, right? So I literally have to remind myself of that because the brain is operating programs of Mm -hmm. idealism, of perfection, of what's attractive. Um, To me, I mean, it's, the harm that one does to themselves and the depriving of enjoying themselves in their life is one aspect of, of that kind of um, uh, false idealism, right? The other just really, really tragic part that I think a lot of people don't think about is if they are casting that sense of uh, disease or I don't like myself or I look horrible or, you know, whatever the storyline is, they, they, they spread that around to the people in their lives, to their children, to their partners. And um, I mean, I think of how many spouses are just looking at their partner, like, I love you no matter what size you are. Right. Yeah. There are going to be some, some people that are like, yeah, I only liked you when you were (laughs) size four, babe. (laughs) There are going to (laughs) be that narrow, but hopefully that's nobody's, nobody's partner that we're talking with. Right. Um, But to the most, most healthy individuals, they're not in love with somebody because of what size they are, right? Right. So why are we doing it? We do these things to ourselves without even, you know, being aware of it. So sometimes all it takes is just a, do I need to, do I need to think these thoughts? 
Are these yeah. thoughts that are healthy to me? And what other, what other kind of, I, I love curiosity questions. Is that even true? Is it even true that I, that I look like a whale? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> well, I don't think I look like a whale and I like whales actually. <laughs> you know what I mean? Anyway, just the, just the questioning, the, the subversive, you know, self-sabotaging thoughts is, is part of the break breaking beyond them. Well, we are truly blessed, the three of us, you know. I'm the same age as uh, King Charles, right? So I kind of oh, feel wow. like I look a little younger than... Fantastic, yeah. So I did get carted at a subway a few years ago. When I <laughs> so I still I still love that memory. But but I mean, just think about the, the people that you are blessing, Jill. And, and mm -hmm. you too, Leslie, as a professor, as a mom, as an educator. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just um, how, how blessed we are to be where we are, who we are, tuned the way we are. And this is all pre-Jill. I mean, we haven't been assessed yet by Jill. We don't have our inventory <laughs> skill set yet. But you also, you said something early on that's kind of intriguing. You said you can't game life or something like that. It can't mm -hmm. be game. And, and Florence Scoville Shin came to mind. You know, she was saying, well, the game of life and how you can win it, something like that. Could you speak a little bit more about gaming life and luck? Last time we spoke, you had a quite long inventory of wisdom on luck. Okay. The idea that we have, the idea that there exists a set of steps and procedures for how to be financially successful, how to be physically healthy, how to live a long, happy life. I believe, and I observe with over 10 years of research, right? Observe, observational research. I, that's a fallacy. So I'm concerned that there are so many individuals that are, that are overconfident that if I just do these things, then I will stay healthy. I don't think the body works that way. Yeah. If I just do these things, then I will, you know, be, you know, have, you know, whatever none millionaire doesn't seem enough now with inflation. So I don't know what number to put, <laughs> but anyway, multimillionaire, how about that? Um, if I just do this and I'll do that. Um, if I just do that, then I'll have the relationship of my dreams, right? If I just do this, then I'll be a great parent. If I just do this, then I'll be a great human, right? There are so many oversimplified methods that to the brain feel like, you know, manna. It's just like, <gasps> Oh my gosh, I'm so glad I have these steps, right? And then yeah. and then one starts dedicating themselves, maybe even dedicating their lives to following these systems and these procedures and they're doing everything according to the book and they're just like, "Okay, I still have asthma or, you know, mm -hmm. I just got diagnosed with cancer." I mean, what the heck? I thought yeah. if I did these things and I would be bulletproof, right? I thought this would lead to that. I thought this would lead to that. So to me, then a lot of humans say, I must be doing it wrong, right? right. And you guys were both, I think, alluding to that earlier. So then that is just another form of self-punishment that gets in the way of them enjoying how amazing they are, what makes them special, what makes them delightful to other people and ideally to themselves too, right? Yeah. So there's this very real factor of unpredictability of things don't don't always out the outcome isn't always what we think it would be or what we think it should be. There's good luck and there's bad luck. I think we all know individuals that no matter what they do, they're not doing anything right <laughs> by by our standards of yeah. what one should do, and everything goes their way. It's like what the heck? They get they get this bonus, they get that you know they get that job promotion, their business success is crazy, and it's like what are you doing? I I I don't know. I, I guess it just works. They don't know why they're so successful, right? Yeah. So that's a kind of a, that's an important data point that they're not following a system and they're having crazy success. I would call that good luck. There are other individuals, I think we all know somebody that it seems like nothing goes right for them. They, mm -hmm. and it, you know, and it's not observable. Like, yeah, they, that happened because they're, you know, they've got this flaw in their character or they're, you know, they're screwed up in this way, or they're diminished in that way, or they're fragmented in that way. They just seem to have bad luck and it's not clear why, right? Yeah. Nothing seems to go their way. So to me, I don't like that, that there's that much 
unpredictability and that much of an of of a, I would call it an error rate in statistics. There's something else that can't be predicted that just happens. It's the error rate. Um, that unknown variable of outcome is important to keep in mind because then you're more honest with yourself. I think we're more generous and we're graceful with ourselves and with others that, oh, I, I did every, I think I did everything right. And it just doesn't go that way. That's, that's a bummer, right? And then yeah. we don't stay in a in a just a bad idea too long, right? Or a bad relationship too long. We don't wait around on the sidelines waiting, um, waiting for something to happen. But this, the truth and the reality to me about good luck and bad luck is the biggest explaining variable in why someone may not be as successful as they think they should be, or why somebody is more successful. <laughs> And maybe yeah. they feel it seems like they deserve to be right. Um, their luck is an important um, and sometimes unnerving part of this reality. And I feel like our soulfulness, our our widest range of self that's operating as well beyond space and time, knows this. And I believe that that range of us is begging for us to know that, account for it. Um, giving ourselves the grace when things don't go as planned and allowing ourselves to be joyful when things go better than planned. Yeah. Right. Not trying to, because so many people, when something goes well, the first thing they want to do is analyze it. Oh, it, then put a story on it. Oh, it must, it, my success or someone's success must be because, you know, oh, it's karmic or, oh, it's right. past life or, oh, it's dharmic. And there's all these things. And I'm like, are you even enjoying it right now? Are you even enjoying yeah. the incredible success or incredible good luck that you just had? When are you going to get to the, the part of the experience that just says, oh, thank you. This is amazing. I don't think I did this, but this is awesome. Yeah. So is yeah. That, yeah go ahead, Leslie. Mm -hmm. um, it's also, um, we're often going through life not being mindful like we're having a cup of tea and instead of just enjoying the tea, we're thinking about what am I going to do after I have this cup of tea or what am I going to do tomorrow? Or my gosh, I still got to do all these things. And we're not just being mindful and enjoying, you know, that beautiful first cup of coffee in the morning. Um, we're just having a conversation with someone and just being enlightened by them. Um, and I think that's important to remember the joy of just the moment, you know, exactly any moment, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody has access to look outside. I think the sky is absolutely beautiful, even yeah. on a rainy day, right? So do I always have, am I always choosing that range of Jill that can see that? No, <laughs> I'm definitely not. Right. But when I am, I'm definitely happiest. I think I'm a better Jill on those days where I'm like, oh, isn't it just beautiful? You know, isn't it just beautiful, right? Yeah. As parents, right? Um, you know, mindfulness reminds me that there's this very famous, and I come across this in my work, folks that are trying to be present in the moment. And I, I find what works better is to be present in yourself. Mm -hmm. The power isn't in the moment. The power is in you, <laughs> right? Yeah. So whether you're, you know, a spouse or, you know, a loved one, um, those, the opportunity to be present with yourself all the way in your body suit, which sounds like such a strange thing to even think about, but yeah. a lot of individuals and a lot of seekers, a lot of strivers, a lot of, um, kind of achievement goal oriented personal growth kind of junkies in a way, right. That can be a form of addiction as well, too. Mm -hmm. Um, we're not even in our body suits. We're not even here. So that detracts from one's ability to be real with themselves and enjoy, you know, what's real in their lives and what them, what's going on in the world. Yeah. Well, you've come up with another best-selling title. The power <laughs> is not within you. The power is within you. The power is you, you know? Yeah. So yeah. You said, say thank you to luck. So I'm wondering, can you gain luck? Can you make love to luck? Uh, there are attitudes and approaches that you can have to life like mindfulness that can maybe increase the odds a little to be lucky. Yeah, I don't want to just pop out an answer for that. I want to I want to feel into this from a wider range of me.
If I say that you can, that one, a person can game luck, I predict that the brain will be just as involved in trying to mechanize success, abundance, and well being as they would have been with anything else. So that's one risk I see, um, which is fine if it worked, but I regularly see that that isn't how it works and doesn't work. So to me, a more loving, honest, truthful answer is that no, you can't game luck. Now, I don't believe that some humans are always unlucky or always lucky. And even when I was referencing earlier that some of us seem to know people that everything seems to go their way, if you look more closely, they can easily point out things to you that are not going their way. And the same thing for somebody with bad luck. They may be even be regularly talking about how they've had another crappy day in their world. And if you really look at it, you're like, but you can, I mean, you may have to nip, you may have to be very microscopic at times, like, but your eyes work, <laughs> you know what I mean? You're able to walk, I mean, you, but, you know, sometimes yeah. that is required to help them see that because the brain, again, if it gets in a pattern and programming of my life stinks, right, then, uh, then it is kind of like a law of attraction kind of thing where they won't even be aware of the things yeah. that don't stink at all in their life and that it could get much more stinky. Um <laughs> So it, it can, that, you know, self-fulfilling prophecy is definitely at play here as well. Well, self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, that's a great phase because what, what I felt when you said, uh, say thank you to luck was an energetic frequency. So mm -hmm. there's the passion test and the purpose test. So how about the luck test? Just to be more consciously aware of any time that anything that could be described mm -hmm. as luck, I think would increase the attraction you don't like attraction, I'll say the allowance, <laughs> the alignment, and the possibility of spreading more luck. I, I'm going to play with that myself and <laughs> come up with. Maybe the three of us will produce something. But I love it. I, if we can <laughs> game good luck, I'm all, I'm all in, Charles. <laughs> um, there, was a, there was a moment, of, I can't remember how many years ago, but I was in a parking lot at a Home Depot, and I was driving... Um, my husband's very nice car. It's a, he sold it since, but it was a Tesla Model X. It's a very dreamy, like, wow, kind of car. Um, so I was driving that car that day and I'm in the parking lot at Home Depot and I'm just kind of waiting for my turn to get my spot. And this guy is backing up and I can tell he's not slowing down. So I'm honking my horn. I'm trying to back up to get out of his way. And there was nothing, I was very aware, very present in myself and could see, I'll do what I can and it may not be enough. So he did crunch into me and it was so sad. Um, but I was honking my horn enough. This was, a, this was a positive thing, trying to get his attention, obviously that driver, that there were a lot of people around going, what is happening? So they could see the whole thing. So I had witnesses. I didn't need them, but I, but I had them. Um, so it was just like, okay. So my response using my system is, okay, this is not what I wanted to do today. Um, but here we go. I'm not hurt. Thankfully he wasn't hurt, but this is going to be a pain in the butt. Right. Um, so I was present in myself and I wasn't rude to him. I did not yell at him. Um, I was very kind of like, okay, I need your ID and I need your insurance. Um, and then there were just weird little things like he had a California ID and I'm like, but he had Idaho plates and I'm like, well, you know, I'm in Idaho. And I said, I said something like, why do you have a California driver's license? And he said, oh, I haven't gotten to it yet. I said it expired four years ago. <laughs> oh, I'm taking wow. any info. So I'm just kind of like, okay. So I'm not, I mean, I'm not trying to pick on this guy, but I'm kind of like, okay, he, he isn't like me. How about that? And I'm not better yeah. than him, but he's probably good at things that I'm not good at. But in this case, I'm like, my driver's license is current. Thank you very much. Anyway, so I just handled the situation. I didn't, it didn't ruin my day. It, it, I, it was a pain in the butt to get all the, you know, work with this insurance, which all went well, right? Getting the car fixed to multiple appointments was not fun. And it was kind of like, I don't want to do this today, but I didn't let it get in the way of me yeah. being a Jill that I like, right? Um, a Jill that I want to be, even if I'm not doing exactly what, I'm, <laughs> what I want to do. Yeah. So that to me is a very real everyday example of how, that to me was bad luck. I definitely had, a, you know, community members that were like, well, what if it meant this? What if it meant that? What if there was a lesson? What if you needed to meet him? And I'm like, I totally hear you. I could put <laughs> all of those stories on that. 
It's not going to change the fact that I've got a car I need to fix. It's got yeah. a ding. In, it's got a minor ding in it, but still a ding that wasn't there before and didn't need to be there. So I don't find value in that kind of interpretation that everything in life has meaning. I don't think it does. Yeah. I think it's just bad luck. And the people that I that I know well, some of my very close friends, and you know, very successful clients, they analyze everything. What does this mean? What does that mean? I saw a moose in the road. What does that mean? I'm like, you can, I can, I can help you. I can offer you a meaning. I can offer you a story, but what if it was also just a moose on the road? Yeah, exactly. Moose end up in the road sometimes. I mean, it was walking across the road and she lives in Wyoming. I mean, it's not, it's not unheard of. (laughs) Anyway. Hmm. So Charles, did I answer the, I don't, we did go into a lot of detail before when we talked about luck and abundance and that kind of stuff. And I may have gone into more detail last time. No, this was fine. Although, but I'm intrigued now and I'm not concerned about time because we can edit stuff, but you, <laughs> you, you, you've said a couple of times, my system or the system, how would you present or uh, introduce the system, the jail system? Mm. I feel like that's what I'm trying to do, Charles. So I have ideas of how to describe it. So in those moments, I, my process is not to go write a book about it. My process is to share with a live group in an online course. Okay. This is, this is, this is what I'm getting about this, 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 and this, and this. So we have different workshops we've done. They're all available. Um, and different things that just come through. And it's so multifaceted that I don't know how to put it into a system because it's part philosophy. um, It's part in addition to a replacement of religious belief. Um, It's definitely contrarian to a lot of psychological and psychiatry training of how the brain works. I mean, like opposing to that. Um, so I don't know if I'll ever get it all into like, this is the system. I, I call it my, I call it my operating system because I know it's different than other people's operating system. And I think our beliefs are a huge part of our operating system beliefs of who and what we are, who and what this world is, who is there, is there a higher power? Is there a God and what is God's relationship in and of this world? Um, all of those are facets of the system. Um, I It wasn't handed to me. Mine was definitely kind of like, okay, that, no, I don't think that works well. I don't see that. I don't observe that working well in my clients, in my clients' lives, this belief system that you create your own reality, for example, or that everything that you experience, you attract, or that every time somebody else acts in a certain way, they're it's you being mirrored back to you by them. There's just a lot of things I've come across and I'm like, that's not true. And I, there's an inner knowing about it. Sometimes I can't prove it. Sometimes I, I can give, you know, anecdotal sort of like, well, if that were true, then um, just to offer them a, an off ramp to something that may be dysfunctional. Um, I wish I could say, here it is. It's in this book, just buy this book. And then you have it. I wish I had that. Um, I do have a free series that's out. It's called the Outwitting with Tico series. That one, it is, it is a little surreal for a lot of folks. It's totally free though. You don't even, I think you do have to go to my website, but I'm going to put it in a podcast, um, podcast format. That is our, our slash my, the widest range of me's best attempt to explain the operating energy, the experiences in this world that are looking very ungodly. Um, When we say, even like when we are impatient with a child and we act in a way that we wouldn't if we were fully present and really choosing our words and choosing our actions and choosing our thoughts and feelings. Um, So it can be that minor and to the major, how does this happen? And it is a, it's a big feature, a big um, explanation set of how does this world really work? So the Outwitting with Tico series, I know it's a strange name, but with Tico is W-E-T-I-K-O. Um, I don't think it's entities. I, I really disagree with a lot of the beliefs that there's, you know, some uh, nefarious force messing with this reality. I, I don't think that's true. And I find that belief system, that operating system, very unhealthy, um, extremely toxic, and it diminishes one's personal authority over their lives and their responses to this world. 
And what's the URL to go and find this amazing? Okay, website? so uh, that's a good question. I don't have a. I mean, the URL is a little long, but if they just, if they just, if anyone does an internet search for Jill Renee Feeler, outwitting with Tico, W E T I K O, it will be right there. And there's a lot of these kind of, but I want to do this new thing and I want to do that new thing. And I have this retreat coming up. There's a lot of things that I, that I love to do in my work. So putting that in a podcast, I do believe it will happen, uh, but it hasn't happened yet. And I can't promise when it will happen. <laughs> so for now, an internet search, will we'll get them there. And it's eight parts. It's all, I think the first part might be in video. Um, and then the other parts are all audio, which can be better for getting beyond the brain. If we're very visual video experiences can be very, the brain keeps saying, yes, I know that I know that, or I disagree with that, or she's wrong. Or, I don't like what she's wearing. Why does she have a pink pillow? Why is her dog snoring? <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Audio well, for those of us that are strong brains tends to be sometimes better. Wow. I want to say, ladies and gentlemen, turn tune in next week <laughs> to see the amazing adventures with the Jill, Leslie, and Charlie. <laughs> now, this has been fantastic. We are just embarking on our interview podcasting and this is really where Charles shines because he knows a billion people. I mean, he's cool. one of the best in connecting with people. And I'm trying to be more comfortable with that because I'm more of an introvert, more, you know, so it's a good combination. But I think it's a great way to just just enlighten yourself with other people's ideas and say, what I'm doing is great, but maybe what someone else is doing might help me more. And just being able to laugh at yourself and go, you know. And even I love what you said about not taking the bad things, just take them with a grain of salt. So this bad experience happened. Yeah, I'm still stuck in it. It's fine. It's OK. I got great health. I'm healthy. You know, my son is doing amazing. He's uh, what do they call it? Neurodiverse, I think, is the new term. And he is a sophomore studying civil engineering and my last 19 years have been solely about him mm. and helping him feel more confident in the world. And mm. it's been a long journey and he's just doing fantastic. And so that's part of, you know, me is that accomplishment. And I can't lessen that because I'm not successful in some other area. So I think it's just being proud of the little, you know, flowers you planted, even if you're still waiting for some to grow is just being proud of that. And, and, uh, and what you guys are, I just want to say, I am, I, it was such an honor to reach out to you guys and to say, Hey, would you ever be open to a conversation? Because you guys do so many beautiful things to share with the world and help people be a better version of themselves. And we are so aligned in that there's so much overlap there. We, we may and probably do have different ideas about what works best or how the world works. That's okay. Right. Yeah. So much, so much of this is beyond evidence and proof. I think it's more healthy to have yeah. conversations with somebody that may have a different view. And I'm very much like you, Leslie. I want to know if there's something yeah. that I'm thinking or something that I'm expecting. And, and there's a flaw in that, in that process of, of what I'm expecting. I want to know, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I can't think of anyone that I would have rather have us initiate this. No. An adventure than with you. I mean, we couldn't have, we couldn't have created a more perfect uh, associate to have on our little screen. Mm -hmm. this yeah, I really appreciate your openness and your sharing. You know what you shared with us today. I think it's fantastic. For everyone, just needs to be more open. You mm -hmm. know, I just really I resonate with the whole spirituality versus religion. That could be a whole nother episode. <laughs> But, you know, my grandfather used to say he can go to church by sitting under a tree. And I used to love that because I feel the same way. I feel like God is within me. Um, and if someone goes to church, I honor that. I think it's wonderful and beautiful that they get a lot out of that. But I'm also open to what I believe. And I think we just need to be more open and just accepting and, you know, whatever somebody's belief is is just honoring that every day. Yeah. There was a, at my um, husband's grandfather's funeral, there was a song that played and I had never heard it before. I think it's Jim Neighbors. Do you remember from Gomer? Gomer oh Park? yeah. Is that right? Uh -huh. from, uh, that Andy Griffith show. 
And I think it was him that was singing it. And it was the beauty of his graces in those wide open spaces, wide mm. open spaces. And there was, I mean, I'm crying at the funeral. And I just remember, I've, and he had picked that song. My grandfather, well, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was my grandfather too, but yeah, the beauty of his grace, God's grace and these, you know, different, different era said his, that's okay to me anyway. Yeah. The beauty of God's grace is in those wide open spaces. Right. I love that. There's so many layers yeah. of symbolism there, right? Because the brain, again, just wants to go, no, not wide open. I want the answer. And I yeah. have to watch out for my brain's tendency and temptation to do that. I'm like, I think it might be bigger than that. I think it may be, yeah. might be more complex than that. But yeah. Hmm. Wow. Well, I love that becoming a, you know, a greater version of myself, just expanding those layers and realizing maybe where I'm operating is just kind of a little too much like tunnel vision. I need to get out of my own way and mm. ask spirit for help if that's what you're comfortable doing, if that's the way that you speak to spirit and just ask to be shown how to be a greater version of yourself, mm. you know, and uh, be open to whatever messages happen to come in. I love that. And I'll, I'll add that even in the moment, I mean, I didn't do this consciously, but in that moment of getting hit from the guy trying to pull out, not noticing I was there, um, there was a, I, there, it was as if there was a part of me going, okay, what do I want to be in this experience? Mm -hmm. Right. What do I want to be? Do I want to be, um, intelligent? Do I want to be wise? <laughs> do I want to get all the details? Do I want to kind of look at him weird and kind of go, really? Expired. My license has been expired five years? Yes, I do want to be that Jill because I'm a little cheeky. <laughs> you know? oh. And he just kind of looked at me because he could have, he was old enough to be my dad. He's like, who are you? Oh. And then he kind of looked at my car. He said, what is that? I'm like, it's a car. And he said, is that one of those electric ones? And I said, yes, it is. <laughs> anyway, so we had a conversation, right? I, I wish him well. <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to handle Anything bad that comes, you know what? I can't change it. It's already happened. Yeah. Let me just see what I can learn from it and move on and don't dwell on it. Mm. You know, don't go telling everybody about it and thinking about it and, you know, just kind of move on and move on to something more positive. And congratulations on your son, Leslie. Thank you. Yes. That's he's exciting. a huge part of my, my happiness and my joy is uh, helping him manage his uniqueness and, you know, helping him cope with that, so. And she didn't mention all the scholarships and the internships and all the other basket of rewards. Yeah, I laugh. Every time I do something to attract something, it always goes to him. Oh, I got another scholarship today, mom. I got this, I got a co-op. It's like all the good luck is, but that's how I want it because, you know, that sets him up for success. And now he's done with all that. I can, it's gonna come back to me now, so. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Hmm. Well, thank you very much, Jill. Thank and you we'll both for all you do. And thank this, you for the opportunity. Probably get this uh, later on in the week. I'll let you know when it's going to be live and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. I'm excited Wonderful. about it. Thank you so much. I can't wait to share this conversation and, and your guys' links and everything uh, with yep. my audience as well. Thank Me you. Too. All mm. right. Charles, well, do you have you. anything I else? Wait, uh, yes, I can't wait for the next steps to be revealed, and there will be <laughs> many of them. So thank you for this teaser. This <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Good job, Leslie. You too. And Ruth, what's your pet's name? I mean, I love that. <gasps> this boy? Yeah. That's Samson. Samson, Aww. while he sat there for Is the it... first few minutes, just looking at the doorknob, like I was wondering if, you know, your husband's ready to come home or something. <laughs> he's a 12-year-old golden retriever, and he's just a doll. Aww. And it's, yeah, he's been a, you know, a lot more care goes for him now that he's this age, but he's just a total sweetheart. Um, well, blessing yeah. Samson. Thank you for sharing Thank you. your time and energy with us. Very <laughs> Thank you, Thanks, dear. Jill. Thank you so much, you guys. Such an honor to, I just, I'm so glad you guys are on the planet. I don't know how else to say it. Well, <laughs> I love you both. I feel the same. Thank you. <laughs> Definitely. Planet bless. We should work with it. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Thank bye. you. Bye-bye.